I would now request uh, Dr. Rajendra Jagdali to kindly bring Mr. Andre Marquez, the Executive Director of Leicester Center for Entrepreneurship, our School of Business, University of California at Berkeley. He's going to present a keynote on creating the next wave of fundable startups in India, the hyper shift and lean startup model. I would now request Mr. Jagdali to kindly introduce uh, Mr. Andre. Thank you, Andrew, for accepting to be one of the key speakers for ISBA 2016. Uh, it has been our fortune that you could make it. Andrew Marquis' association with India is not new. He was involved in some of the programs with DST. And, uh, He's going to speak on creating next wave of fundable startups in India, the hypershift and lean startup model. We had a the, the master class on lean startups, and he's a keynote on lean startups now. Andrew, please. Oop, it's going to slide off now. It's good. Well, uh, Dr. Michelkar, you could not have done a better job of setting up my discussion today. Hold on one second here. And um, let's see if I get my slides up. Fantastic. So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about the shift to the lean startup at UC Berkeley. Um, ah, I have a clicker. And, and really the ramifications for, for India. So, I am lucky to work at an amazing institution. UC Berkeley is one of the top three research institutions in the world. Um, we actually have more top graduate programs than any other university in the United States, uh, including several that were mentioned today. Um, we are a public university as well, so we don't necessarily have the deep pockets of our competition. Um, and so we have to do more with less. And part of what I'm gonna talk about today is doing more with less. Um, we are the place where Steve Blank started the Lean Startup Movement. Uh, he's been teaching in the Hospital School Business for about 13 years, and when I arrived at the Hospital School Business five years ago, Steve was teaching uh, 10 startups in his class. Uh, and of course, we are lucky enough to be immersed in Silicon Valley uh, as well. But what was interesting when I came to Berkeley five years ago, um, I saw something really interesting, which is I myself am a serial entrepreneur, so I've been part of starting seven companies, uh, had a couple IPOs, a couple large acquisitions, uh, at least one failure. Um, and um, we were teaching entrepreneurship the same way when I arrived five years ago as we were when I graduated 20 years ago. I know it's hard for you to believe that I got my MBA 20 years ago with how little gray hair, hair I have. Um, but we had three business plan competitions. We taught business plan writing. Every other major business school taught business plan writing as well. And of course, business plan writing is really um, a reflection of trying to teach startups the skills you teach people who work at large companies. And the skills that are needed are completely different. Now, I've been an angel investor. Um, and so I really went back and, and thought, you know, what is your number one problem when you're an investor? And all of you who run uh, incubators and accelerators, you are investors, right? Absolutely. What's your number one problem? Money, space. No, here's your number one problem. You can't pick winners, right? You can't pick winners. Startup comes in. Is it gonna be a good startup, a bad startup? Is it gonna be fundable? Is it gonna implode the next day? Do customers really want this? Will they pay for it? You can't pick winners. By the way, don't feel badly. I can't pick winners. No one can pick winners. What is the success rate of venture capital investments in Silicon Valley? Roughly. 30%, roughly 30% return at least the capital invested. That's venture capital. If you are a seed stage investor or an angel investor, well, I actually cannot find good data on this in the United States or anywhere else. And I have a feeling the reason that is is nobody wants to show it. Um, it is impossible to pick winners. And so 
it really forces you to look at the problem differently if you really embrace that notion. And I, and I want to take a team from um, a program we ran for Intel, this is actually a global program, um, called uh, the uh, Make It Wearable Challenge. This is the winning team. Uh, they're on stage at the Consumer Electronics Show um, at, uh, in Las Vegas. And this is their cool 3D printed uh, product that has an Intel chip in it. I'm wondering if you can play, uh, play the first video back there. So you have to guess what this product is. Let's see if they can... Uh... I only have a couple videos here, so if we can't make it work... Oh, there we amazing go. Amazing perspective because it can fly. You just flick it off your wrist. You don't need a remote control. Can we see it live? I think we should give it a try. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so what is it? That's live. That's real. <laughs> so yes. So that is a, a that is. A, that that is a 3D printed flying selfie drone. Very cool, great tech demo, right? Is that a business? Is that a business? I don't know the answer to that. I can't pick winners. Um, so, um, so, so when I got to Berkeley, um, also we had uh, 12, not only were we teaching business plan writing, and again, everybody else was, not, a, not the fault of Berkeley. We also, we had 12 teams in our incubator and they met with their mentors once a quarter. Great mentors, amazing mentors, venture capitalists, successful entrepreneurs, amazing mentors, they met with them once a quarter. When I looked at what we had to do to be successful, um, I had to take my own medicine. And so I really had to look at this, right? If you want winners, if you can't pick winners, the first thing you need to do is you need to have scale. You need to place a lot of bets. At UC Berkeley, 12 is not enough bets to get a winner. People are working on amazing technologies, um, nanotech, you know, nanoparticle coatings for windows, medical devices, things that are hard. You gotta place a lot of bets. You have to have scale. The other thing that's really interesting, and again, um, to the discussions today that I, I learned so much from is, um, India as a country has a scale problem. I will tell you, UC Berkeley as a university has a scale problem too, which is 80% of my MBA students want, say they want to be entrepreneurs, um, and my center is 100% self-supported. So, uh, you know, so it's a challenge. How do we get to scale? How do we do a lot of experiments? The other challenge is you have to have intensity. You have to actually test the businesses that your entrepreneurs come in with. This is the other great challenge of incubators. The problem with an incubator, you have space. You put a team in your space, if they're not doing the work, it's really hard to kick them out. If you don't run a very systematic process, they are not actually testing all the components of their business model that are necessary to scale. You can have great mentors, but mentors give isolated pieces of advice. They are not looking holistically at a company. And so you need to run a very intense and very structured process. And if you get to scale, you're testing hundreds of ideas through startups. If you run a really intense process, winners will emerge. And so I think you have to ask yourself when you look at what you are doing, what you're investing in, does it have these two properties? The other key component of this, which is something I really didn't think about when we started, was the only way you can learn to be an entrepreneur is to be an entrepreneur, right? I mean, this goes right to so many of the comments I heard today about Students are good at test taking. Students cannot deal with uncertainty. Look, the only way to learn how to deal with uncertainty is to deal with uncertainty. 
And the safest place to do that is within a structured environment and learning a set of structured questions that help you de-risk your startup in a very structured way. And so what we have a process that embraces both startup acceleration, meaning we are testing real ideas in the real world with real customers who at some point we're expecting to pay, hopefully soon, and we are teaching our students and entrepreneurs to deal with uncertainty. So we are actually teaching them the most important skill that they need to learn. And we can do it all in the classroom and I'll talk a little bit about how we do this. So, um, so I draw this diagram of what we do because it is a funnel. If you are a startup team in one of our programs and you begin our program, you will make it to the end of our program. But when you get to the end of our program, most often the decision that you make is you will not continue to spend time on this, per, this startup. That is very, a very interesting property of running a very intense program. So we start with Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad class. That's about two months. The teams all have to get out of the building and they have to talk to 100 people. Customers, partners, payers. Uh, and they do this in a very structured way. So we teach them customer interviewing skills, we teach them what a business model is, we teach them what a channel is, sort of all these components. So it's education plus acceleration. Most teams have not talked to 100 people in years. I've met startups that literally, they've been around for five years, they, I, I guarantee they have not talked to 100 customers. Um, this is a pretty easy process to do once you push it. And then, if a team decides they have a customer, they have some product market fit, they figured out how their customers pay, then they can go into something, um, our launch uh, accelerator. And this is really about, do you have business scalability? You have to go out and try to sell. Is that selling online? Is that selling in person? You have to build a prototype, you have to test it. It's very data-based. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the goal is to get to fundability. Now, um, you talked about trust. I believe that trust is important as well in a startup ecosystem, but I believe data is more important. If you are a startup and you have talked to 100, 120 customers, you've built a prototype, you've measured it, you've gone out and tried to sell, you know how many sales calls you need to make to get a customer, you know what your lifetime value of customer is to a rough approximation you know what your customer acquisition cost is to a rough approximation. You have data, and so the conversation you have with an investor after a mere six months is a completely different conversation because it is based on data you acquired from the real world under an intense process that was pushing you to ask the right questions. Our startup accelerator this year, we had 24 teams go through it, Almost all of them had students. They raised more than $8 million in less than four months. We had a demo day that had 60 investors, but most of the teams had already received checks. But that's because what the investors told us is they were having a data-based conversation, not a I like Berkeley and I think your students are smart conversation. Um, and so this push uh, has completely changed uh, the maturity of our startups and what we teach uh, our students. Now, it really goes to another problem, which is what I always like to think, since I've been much more an entrepreneur than an investor, what's the number one problem if you're an entrepreneur? Who's gonna give me money? Is my product gonna work? Who do I hire? What's the number one problem? What do I do next? <laughs> and especially if you're a first-time entrepreneur. So by running a very structured program, you help frame the questions. Uh, and we do this pretty simply. We do everything's hypothesis-driven. Guess, who's your customer? Guess, go out and do some customer interviews. Is that really your customer? Are you really solving a problem? What is the problem you're solving? So then every week, you have to come back and report. What experiments did you run? What did you learn? What are you gonna do next? It's a very simple uh, data-driven process. Let me give you an example of where this can help. So we, we helped run 
uh, Innovate for Digital India last year, which was a really fantastic program funded by the Department of Science and Technology, funded by India, an amazing program. Over 3,000 startups from every state in India applied. It was very hard uh, to whittle down to the final 40. Um, this was done in partnership with CIIE right here in Pune. So when I got to the Pune airport, I knew exactly what to do because I've been here a number of times and they were an absolutely fantastic uh, partner in this. And this is one of my favorite teams. Um, and I never could pronounce their name correctly. So someone's got to help me here. Thank you. Thank you. Languages is not one of my, uh, my long suits. Um, they'd been working on a smartphone app for farmers. Uh, they came from rural villages. The whole point of Innovate for Digital India was to use technology to, um, to help the poor, right? E-health, agriculture, government, um, and finance. R amazing program. Again, teams from all over the world. So they had a smartphone app. They had 20,000 users of their smartphone app. Second week in the program, they came, they came, we were actually doing this on a web conference because we can do everything online, and they had that sort of depressed look that people have when they have a bad week of customer interviews. Ugh, Andre, and I could, I could tell right on the web conference, I said, hey guys, what's wrong? And they said, Andre, we figured out our customers can't pay us. I'm like, well, tell me more about that. They're like, well, our customers are farmers. Farmers don't have bank accounts. Far I, I mean, it, you know, it sounds obvious. And, and the reason I bring it up specifically with these teams is these are great entrepreneurs. I would invest in this team in a minute because they immediately turned that around and the next week they had completely re-envisioned their whole business model. Um, they now make Wi-Fi poles. So they set up, I think, 200 Wi-Fi poles in villages across India. Um, they still have their smartphone app, so the whole goal is still to enable rural farmers, but these are great entrepreneurs. But really by taking them through a structured process and forcing them to really ask the tough questions about their business model, they made an insane uh, amount of, um, of progress. And now they are delivering a huge amount of good out there to rural villages. Um, so one of the things that to me is very important about this kind of acceleration process is it doesn't matter whether you're science or your social good. The same rigor should apply because it's all about getting big and having a lot of impact. And if that's making 350 bucks a piece on an iPhone, okay, that's great. I, why I already ordered the new iPhone. Um, and if it's helping farmers in rural villages, um, using smartphones to uh, read for cervical cancer, all these kinds of things. That's all about helping as many people as you can. And one of the big things we've done at Berkeley is really do this framework big in social entrepreneurship. So a little bit about how we do it. So it, I call it structured scalability testing, right? You're trying to go through and figure out, can this idea get big and impact a lot of people? It's hypothesis driven. Let me make some guesses. Let me gather some data. It's very customer focused. Some people call this design thinking, but you often have to teach entrepreneurs how to interview. It's all about validating a business model. Even if you are a nonprofit, you need to stay in business. So you need to have a scalable business model. Now, it may be that most of your money is government grants, some of it's from customers, all that kind of stuff, but you have to have a business model or you go out of business. It is very numbers driven, and I encourage all of you as you look at your own accelerator programs, are people measuring real data? Can you tell from week to week to week if they're making progress? It structures mentor interactions. By running a structured process, you narrow the questions teams ask mentors. You keep the mentors focused on the most critical issues facing the teams as they go through the process. That makes mentors much more effective as coaches and as subject matter experts. And you have the ethos of up, pivot, or out. And this is very hard if you run an accelerator and you've let teams in and teams have space. And this is why 95% of what we do at Berkeley is we run virtually, meaning People come into classrooms, we do it online, these kinds of things. We don't have people, people can have space in their laboratories, people can have space at home, people can have space in other incubators, and many of them do. 
Um, but we run, we're running a process. We're running a testing and educational acceleration process. The space is, is a secondary component of it. Um, and the teams always know they are trying to make real life honest decisions about what's in front of them. And if that means they need to go build a Wi-Fi pole, fantastic, because that's how they're gonna get paid so they can help farmers. That's real. If they have a smartphone app that has 20,000 users, none of whom can pay, um, that's not gonna go any further than the government, the money the government gave them. And that is incredibly important and is the hardest discipline of running this kind of program. The other component of this is by using a structured framework, you can scale to hundreds of teams. So it, at UC Berkeley in three and a half years, we went from 12 teams in our incubator meeting with mentors once a quarter to 290 teams in almost 20 countries uh, and no incubator. I closed the incubator space. Um, and uh, we've had a team acquired for $268 million. Uh, we've had multiple teams raise over $10 million. And as, as I said, in our startup competition. So you can completely change the conversation around this. Now, the other thing I will say about it is it creates a culture of entrepreneurship. It creates an ecosystem. Let me give you an example. We ran a program called America's Greatest Maker. So it was a reality TV show by the producers of Shark Tank. How many of you have heard of Shark Tank? All right. They, need, they have Shark Tank in India, right? If they don't, they have to. So it was by the producers of Shark Tank. It was funded by Intel. We ran the accelerator. It was a million dollars winner take all competition. A million dollars winner take all. 24 teams. We're down in Hollywood on a soundstage with the judges, the CEO of Intel, a steam panel of judges. Every team has to give a demo. Every team has to pitch and take questions from the judges. One of the teams, his product is broken. It's not working. One of the other team members from a different team came over and is sitting there literally seconds before the guys to go on stage soldering his prototype so he can go out there and compete against them. Because what they realize as entrepreneurs is when you win, the other person doesn't lose. There is more than enough opportunity for everyone and it's great to win a million dollars, but that's not a, what it's about. The gifts that this gives going forward are much bigger. And so by building a scalable system where you have hundreds of teams, you can affect culture change. And I will talk a little bit more about that. But one thing I wanted to show you was uh, part of the process. Um, and if you could switch um, to video number two, that would be great. So this is uh, one of our teams. This happens to be the chief the guy standing at the back is the chief of general surgery at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, which is one of the top three medical schools in the US. Again, he's the chief of general surgery. This is a group of surgeons making a product for surgeons. Oh, let's see if we can get some audio. And this is week two of the program. Anyway, we can get the audio up. I can probably annotate over it if you want. All right. Oh, we're not gonna get audio. Well, so, so, uh, so, so I'll tell you what's going on here. So this is a team, they're in the second week of the program, they showed their business model canvas, they're making a product for surgeons. Yeah, a product that could prevent a bio, bio leak. Oh, there we go. So Hobart's pupils dilated at that point. <laughs> so not, not, not the surgeons, but his pupils dilated. If we could prevent the bio leak for that surgeon, they would pay a lot more money for that. But for the, the product that we're proposing, they even thought $1,000 might be too high for that. Uh, that, that, that would be too high of a price to pay for that, that product. So these are things that we learned. Awesome. So did you feel like this was a worthwhile week? Did you learn something? Oh, it, it, it saved us probably several years worth of... No, seriously. Of, no, seriously. Because our, our thought is that surgeons would embrace this, right? 
And so what we didn't realize is that they're not embracing it because they don't think it's a, a problem that they have. So uh, we're for we're Vitruvian medical yeah. devices. And you can cut it. You can cut product. it. I'll go, yes. I'll go to the next slide. But did you hear what he said? He said, we went out and talked to people, and they said they wouldn't even pay $1,000 for what we proposed, repairing hernias, but they paid $20,000 to prevent a bio leak, which is another application of the technology. This is a group of surgeons making a product for surgeons, and they had to go out and interview 14 surgeons in order to realize they weren't actually solving an important problem for surgeons. This is, nor and again, it's not that these people are not smart. That is the chief of general surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, right? Don't think about it that way with startups. You're running this rigorous process so they have the chance to reflect. That is absolutely critical. Um, the other thing he said, what was the other thing he said? He says it right on the slide. It probably saved us several years. By, with us at Berkeley, by us running a much more rigorous and intense acceleration process, um, we have been able to save teams a huge amount of time by having them honestly face the questions in front of them and building a culture of that, they go much faster, much faster. Um, and, and, and that's something I often see missing from programs. So I'll just do a couple more slides here to finish. So, so one is you can actually automate a lot of this. Um, and I'm more than happy to share the tools, the frameworks, all of our curricula, everything after this. So if you're interested, you can come up afterwards and uh, um, talk about this. But this is me running um, a, an accelerator for 21 teams in 11 countries spread across 15 time zones with two other faculty members and three teaching assistants. And it looks remarkably like my desk at UC Berkeley. Um, we do many, many things online. When we ran Innovate for Digital India, many of the teams were in residence here in Pune. Many of the teams were back in their home um, states working with customers. And so they could come in on the web conference and we could still run a very rigorous process. So one way to think about it is you as accelerator managers, you can have a bunch of teams in residence and you can build, you can have teams that are not in your facility as part of your accelerator and increase the number of teams that you are testing to get to that scale easily by a factor of 10. And certainly we've been able to do that at Berkeley with a whole bunch of different partners really building a uh, global ecosystem. Um, I can talk a little bit more about how it's measurable, but because all the teams are working in a system, we can measure their progress every week, how many interviews they're doing, how many pivots they're doing. So it's a highly measurable process. Uh, it's been very scalable. We've gone from 12 to over 290 teams a year. Um, we've been doing this for the National Science Foundation as the Bay Area node of the NSF Innovation Corps. Uh, the NSF Innovation Corps is now over 700 teams a year, um, taught by seven nodes across the United States, so the me methodology has been replicated. Uh, we've been able to train over 60 instructors, and what to me is interesting and this is my ambition for India, and it is not that India adopts the model we have adopted in the US. My ambition is that you come up with your own model that, has, that you are am, as ambitious with as our government has been in the United States, really backed by the power of Steve Blank. Steve Blank is really the person to credit with this change in our government, but basically, the U.S. National Science Foundation has adopted this methodology. The U.S. National Institutes of Health has adopted this methodology, um, customized specifically for healthcare business models. The U.S. Department of Energy is testing this across the United States. The U.S. Department of Defense has adopted it as well. So in the United States, this structured, scalable acceleration program style is what our government is using to commercialize over $70 billion worth of research. Um, and they, by building a replicatable system that we can train people across the country to replicate and to adapt to their own local conditions, local curricula, all that, um, we're literally doing this uh, at hundreds of universities across the United States. So again, my ambition is not to replicate what we've done in the United States here in India, but it's for you to have the ambition to take these core principles around scalability and intensity and adapt them for the incredible demand you have here. And I can say from my experience here, um, 
you know, India has four times as many people as the United States. That means you have four times as many geniuses. Um, and I'm not kidding about that. It is absolutely true. I have seen the impact of the Indian startup community in Silicon Valley, which others have talked about today. Um, and to bring that here to this country and for you to be even more ambitious than we have been in the United States um, is, is my, uh, my ultimate goal in talking about this. Um, certainly our startups are fundable. Um, we more than tripled the funding rates of National Science Foundation research in the first two years of this program. We did an extensive research project with Stanford University on that. Um, and again, my ambitions for here are localized programs across India, connected ecosystem, um, funded startups with higher success rates, successful outcomes to investors, and if you want bridges to Silicon Valley, we're more than happy uh, to, to help with that. But really the key, as many of you have talked about today, is culture change. And I'm gonna tell you, this is my own personal position as an entrepreneur. The only way you get culture change is with numbers. It is about how many people you put through a real accelerator program who really have the opportunity to have their lives changed by understanding whether being an entrepreneur unleashes them or whether it's the scariest thing they ever did and they will never do it again, which by the way is a very common outcome. But within an educational setting that requires no one to quit their job, no one to leave school, you can give someone the real experience of being an entrepreneur while creating real and fundable startups at the same time. So I will leave you with that. It is such an honor and a privilege to uh, get a chance to present here. And uh, I'm so excited about everything that's going on in this country. And I really hope to be part of it. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are all uh, set for the awards uh, function, but please stay back as uh, the entertainment program has already been planned. But before that, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Pramod Chowdhury, the president of SciTech Park Pune, to kindly come over. I would also request Dr. Raghunath Mashal to kindly come over once again. And I would request Dr. Pramod to give a memento to uh, Dr. Raghunath Mashal. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. And also, I would now request Mr. Pratap Pawar, the Vice President of Scientech Park uh, Pune, to kindly come over and give a memento to Mr. Andre Marcus. Mr. Andre Marcus, I would request you to kindly come back to the stage once again. Thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, I would request all of you to kindly stay back in the hall because uh, another five to seven minutes, we'll set up the stage for the entertainment and the awards function. So do stay back and uh, keep your energies intact. I am very sure that with the two keynote uh, speeches, you're all rejuvenated. Let's hear it once again for the esteemed keynote speakers. It was indeed a privilege being here. So thank you, sir, once again. And do stay back. We'll set up the stage in the next five to seven minutes.